Get out of here before I break the bank. Come on, man. Paul, are you okay? You should have left them on the street where you found them. Get off me, man! Well, right, hold on. Get him out of here. 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 You're burning. Tell me. Now you knocked him down. Why don't you try knocking me down now? Tommy Gunn only fights in the ring. Let's get out of here. My ring's outside. Yeah? Let's do it. Come on! There's nothing like some good old revenge. It leaves you with a satisfying feeling like you're on top of the world. And Michael Jordan certainly has had his fair share of that experience. When you tick him off or provoke him in any way, he turns psychotic. Once you poke the bear, it's too late. You better believe he's going after you. You mother will be playing basketball in Pelican Bay when I get finished with you. I'm the man up in this piece. King Kong ain't got shit on me! So sit back and relax as we go through some of the best Michael Jordan revenge stories. Contrary to popular belief, Jordan does have the ability to get along with his opponents. He didn't feel like being intense all the time. Playing golf was his go-to off-the-court activity and didn't mind if a player wanted to tag along. But that hospitality wasn't fooling Jeff Van Gundy. Van Gundy said that MJ would befriend his opponents, making them think that he's a nice guy, just to gain a competitive advantage. His way is to befriend them, to soften them up, make them feel like he cares about them, and then he goes out there and physically tries to destroy them. And if Van Gundy thought that he could get away with that without any consequences, he was wrong. He made those comments the day before his New York Knicks were about to play the Chicago Bulls. And the next morning, his quotes were all over the Chicago newspaper. And that's when Jordan saw what he said. And that only gave him extra motivation to go out there and destroy. It was January 21st, 1997, Knicks visiting Chicago. Once the ball was thrown up in the air, it was time for some sweet revenge. Michael had a personal vendetta for Van Gundy. They shot less than 40%. Jordan gets his first of the night. I think he felt he got pushed a little bit. Oh. Michael Jordan with the assist and then he glanced over at the New York bench at Jeff Van Gundy. Fourth quarter, 1-10 to go. Jordan in the post over Houston. <laughs> Jordan jawing with Jeff Van Gundy. Jordan was cursing at Jeff Van Gundy during the entire game. Jordan with 49. Jordan now has 51. And he is screaming at Jeff Van Gundy. MJ ended the game with 51 points, doing exactly what he planned to do. He was unstoppable, but he wasn't done yet. It was said that immediately after the game, he ran to find Jeff Van Gundy once again and continued to curse him out in the tunnel. Then Van Gundy tried to backtrack what he said during a post-game interview. What's that now? I couldn't hear you. saying some of the things about the course of the week about Michael Jordan. I didn't say anything this week about it. What did you say to him after that last basket? Some chores work. Can you give us a clean version? No. Now, you would think that George Carl would learn from Van Gundy's mistake, considering this matchup was only one week after that Knicks game. You know, a few weeks ago, a Knicks coach, Jeff Van, Van Gundy, in effect called Michael Jordan a con man. He reacted with a 51-point game. Well, this week, as you've seen in the pregame, George Carl said Michael Jordan was playing as if he didn't want to get hurt. I asked Michael about that. He said, George Carl is just playing mind games. As you just heard right there, earlier that week, as George Carl's supersonics were getting ready to face the Bulls, he said that Michael Jordan basically became a jump shooter in order to avoid getting hurt while driving to the hoop. And he went on to say that Jordan changed his game because he could no longer fly to the basket for dunks, and that he was holding back in order to protect himself in the later stages of his career. The air has gone out of Jordan's game and Michael did not hesitate to quickly respond. Quote, I'm not scared to go anywhere on the court. When teams give me the jump shot, I'll take it. If they take away the lanes, I'll go for the jump shot. And Ron Harper had some advice for Carl. If I was Coach Carl, I'd be quiet. To say anything about Michael's game is ridiculous. 
Even though Michael did get his point across verbally, you know he wasn't finished with George Carl yet. It was February 1st, 1997, about 8 months after the Bulls defeated Seattle in the 96 finals, and right out of the gate, instead of falling for the trap and driving to the basket like Coach Carl wanted, Jordan did the exact thing Carl was talking about, shoot multiple jump shots. MJ was on fire, even shooting a half-court shot right in front of George Carl. Across the midcourt line. an amazing distance. I think George Carr would have rather seen him drive to the basket than take that jump shot. Jordan continued to dominate with his jump shot all night long, making Coach Carl feel stupid for ever opening his mouth. Coach Carl had made the comments that Michael Jordan may be becoming too much of a jump shooter. Well, here's a jump shot on a little hesitation move over Hersey Hawkins and just a little look over towards the bench and backing up to say, there's your jump shot. Eventually, it was getting ridiculous. Jordan could not be stopped as he ultimately ended the game with 45 points. Michael, now, the statements by George Carl saying that you're playing trying not to be hurt. Was that motivation for you today? You know, I, I think Carl, what he's saying is, you know, more or less trying to get me to go to the hole. I'm going to shoot my jump shot. Defense will give me the jump shot. I'm going to take it. If they want to let, let me go to the hole, open up the lane. I go to the hole. After the game, Ron Harper commented again, saying, I'm surprised the coaches don't learn. Every time they say something about Michael, it hurts their team. Well, this next coach, John Calipari, actually did learn to keep quiet. He saw what happened to the last two coaches and wanted none of that. We all are aware that MJ and the 98 Bulls were determined to complete their second three-peat and their first opponent in the 98 playoffs were the New Jersey Nets with John Calipari as their head coach. The first two games of the series were close, but Chicago found a way to get both victories and they only needed to win one more game to sweep the Nets. Since this was back when the first round was the best of five, New Jersey went into game three believing that they had a great chance to win this one considering they were so close to winning the other two games. But when you you're facing a man that literally makes up scenarios in his head in order to just find anything that will fuel him, you're probably in trouble. You see, Coach Calipari didn't necessarily do anything wrong in this particular instance. He didn't say a single word to or about Jordan, but he didn't have to. It was just the way he coached that rubbed Jordan the wrong way. Michael said he found it very annoying that John Calipari was always screaming towards his players at the top of his lungs, running up and down the court. He thought he was overdoing it with his sideline antics and said that he doesn't know how the Nets players deal with him. Well, it looked like Jordan found his reason to go ahead and torch them. He went with it and never looked back. And here's Jordan, left open for the three, and he's got it. Michael Jordan. He has been a potent weapon for the Bulls against the Nets this year. Jordan working against Kittles. Gets Kittles in the air, and Jordan hits. Patented Michael J. Four fouls. Jordan coming around, a Rockman screen hits. Michael Jordan now with 36 points. He's hardly missed from the field. Major striking distance here, and like you say, they play in peaks and valleys. Michael Jordan, oh, a very oh, difficult oh, shot, oh, falling oh, away toward the baseline. Michael finished off the Nets with 38 points, and later after the game, John Calipari said this about Jordan's death stare, quote, I didn't stare back. There is one thing I would never do as a coach, say anything to Michael Jordan, not one word. If he wants to stare at me, I'm not going to say anything to him. Man, no matter what you do, you're never really safe. But this next player was literally asking for it. It was 1994, during Michael Jordan's baseball days. Brian Russell, who was a member of the Utah Jazz, was preparing to play Chicago in an upcoming game. So the night before, he went to go work out, and that's when he saw Michael Jordan with his baseball trainer and thought it was the perfect opportunity to introduce himself. So he went up to MJ and said, Why'd you quit? Why did you retire? I really wanted to get the chance to guard you and defend you because I know I can stop you. Dumbass motherfucker. And Jordan just laughed it off and acted like he wasn't even bothered. But we all know Michael made sure to remember what he said. 
Now fast forward to 1996, Jordan was back in the league, and when he played Utah, he was well aware that Russell would be there. And right before the jump ball, he turned to Russell and said, Remember back in 94? You're about to get your chance. Oh, what a move by yes. What a right little left. What a show, and they love it here in Utah. Here's Watch Michael. Michael's move. Watch this. Whoop. Where'd he go? Oh. Oh, poor, man. Poor Brian Russell. That broke his ankles. And ever since, Brian Russell had a huge bullseye on his back as MJ made an effort to go after him every single time they played each other. Now fast forward again a couple years later, Jordan could practically taste his sixth championship as he would get a chance to take the lead after stripping the ball from Malone. And would you look at that, Michael couldn't ask for a better guy to guard him. Russell claimed that Jordan obviously pushed off. But at the end of the day, there was nothing he can do about it. Many years later, at the tail end of MJ's Hall of Fame speech, he talked a little bit about Brian Russell and said this. Believe me, I relished on that point, and from this day forward, if I ever see him in shorts, I'm coming at him. <laughs> and Russell took that as a challenge. Yeah, how's it going for you? Good, good, good. Just making sure I stay in somewhat shape. Uh, getting ready to call out MJ. <laughs> you and Michael on this court, you spot him six, game seven, who wins? On this side. I'll whoop his ass. That's it. Hands down. Okay, last one. When MJ arrived on the scene, he was like nothing we've ever seen before. He had stardom written all over him and effortlessly made the all-star team as a rookie. But what was supposed to be a special night for the young kid turned out to be ruined by what is now known as the infamous freeze out. It's been said that allegedly Isaiah Thomas came up with a plan to not pass Jordan the ball on purpose and convinced all the other players to do the same which seemed to have actually worked, considering Jordan only scored 7 points for the whole night. Some people say that everyone was jealous by all the attention MJ was getting, and they found him very arrogant. And others say it was because MJ was more beloved in the city of Chicago than Isaiah was, who is a Chicago native. Either way, they did not want Jordan to be the star of the All-Star game. And it looked like Jordan took it personal, because just two nights later, the Chicago Bulls' very first opponent after the All-Star break was the Detroit Pistons. And Michael absolutely went off, putting up 49 points, 15 rebounds, and 5 assists. And from there on out, Michael played possessed whenever he faced Detroit, forming a rivalry. But Jordan and the Bulls kept coming up short in the playoffs. They just couldn't seem to get past the Pistons until finally, in 1991, they swept them, causing Isaiah and the rest of the team to walk off without shaking hands. And MJ took that as a slap to the face. And a few months later, Isaiah would learn to regret that decision. In the summer of 1991, the members of the USA Basketball Committee took note and remembered the unsportsmanlike move Isaiah did and decided to leave him off of the 1992 Olympic team, now known as the Dream Team. At first, many were confused about that decision, but then it all started to make sense because it was rumored that Michael orchestrated the whole thing by saying that he would only play on the team if Isaiah was not on the team, getting some sweet revenge with his own little freeze out. Alright guys, I know there are several more Michael Jordan revenge stories out there, but this is where I'm gonna end the video. So make sure to comment down below what your favorite one was, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.